Okay. Sorry, that was... Uh... Okay, I think I've got everything straightened out. Okay, so... Um... This is going to be something new for me, and I apologize if there's going to be some uh, technical hiccups. There already have been technical hiccups. Um, but um, my hope is that uh, streaming might be a little bit um, uh, easier for, uh, for progress updates than uh, doing these, these big edited videos. Uh, and I can save the big edited videos for you know when something really exciting happens. Um, so, uh, just to kind of talk through the, uh, the goal of today's live stream, I'm going to start by just kind of recapping, uh, what hap or what I've done in 2019, the progress I've made. Um, and then, um, uh, after I've, uh, talked about that, uh, talk about my plans for 2020, kind of the, the next steps in the project. And uh, then I'll kind of just do a kind of open questions if there's anything that anyone uh, wants to know. So I'm going to apologize in advance if uh, for the first part of the, the live stream, I'm a little less um, uh, attentive to chat. I'm going to try not to ignore it completely, but let's get everything. Okay, so the... Um, 2019 uh, was a year where, kind of similar to past years, I've made what I consider a decent amount of progress, but it's not very exciting progress. Um, if you look behind me here, you can see a whole table of stuff I've worked on um, at some point over the year, and uh, I'd like to kind of take you all through it. So, one of the... Um, Kind of the guiding principle of the project has been um, I want to do things the right way. The, the absolute worst thing I could do is take a whole bunch of shortcuts and produce an instrument that not only doesn't work but kind of uh, uh, kills interest in the, the very idea of the instrument. So that's why some of the progress has been frustratingly slow. Trust me, no one's more frustrated than I am as far as I want the thing to be real. Um, so with that in mind, uh, some of you may have seen uh, that uh, about a, a little over a year ago, I bought a, um, a 3D printer. And the original plan was to make uh, just other stuff, not to use it... Uh, not using it for the, the subcontrabassoon. So I did a whole bunch of doodads. You may have seen the, uh, the 3D printed serpent I made. I didn't model this. Uh, you can actually find uh, plans online. I tried... Uh, a racket, this one isn't very good. Uh, a whole bunch of crumb horns. A low A bell for my contrabassoon. So on and so on. Now, um, like I said, my original plan wasn't to use the uh, the 3D printer to make any part of the subcontrabassoon. I might, I might have planned to use it for uh, templates or jigs or... It, something like that, but not any part of the finished instrument. But as I uh, got more comfortable with 3D printing, I came to see that there were um, advantages. I mean, obviously with 3D printing, um, it's easy and it's considerably less expensive. But once again, that wasn't my goal with the project, isn't to make something as quick and cheap, cheap as possible, my goal is to make a real playable prototype that will demonstrate the value of the instrument. And I'm not going to do that with something kind of, you know, halfway done. But uh, what really began to change my mind is 
Well, I'm going to open up a, um, a window here. Uh, some of you may be comfortable with 3D printing. Uh, others may not. Okay. So, this is a segment of a subcontrabassoon joint. Mm, right here. Now, the... Here. Actually, hold on. And here is an actual printed version of that. Now, what ultimately made me change my mind and decide to use 3D printing for uh, nine, the nine largest body joints... Um, wasn't because it was cheaper or faster or easier, but because of weight concerns. So here's a subcontrabassoon joint. Now, if we put it in the, the slicing software, you know, that's what we see from the outside. But if we go to the interior, you'll see, um, a... you'll see one of the big advantages of 3D printing is that it doesn't need to be solid on the inside. So, for comparison, this, uh, this is the largest uh, subcontrabassoon, wait, yes, the largest subcontrabassoon body joint. The original plan was to machine this out of Delrin. Um, that would have made, meant that this joint would weigh one and a half kilograms just by itself. Uh, that's about 3.2 pounds. Um, a maple version. So uh, I want to, you know, the goal is to designed this in such a way that it could be eventually made out of maple, like a, like a bas normal bassoon or contrabassoon. Uh, the, uh, the plastic is just for the prototype. Um, a maple version would weigh 0.8 kilograms, uh, or 1.7 pounds, and that's just for this joint. With, with uh, 3D printing, I have a scale here. A scale that's out of batteries um, but I weighed it just earlier this afternoon and know that uh, 3d printed in plastic it weighs um, about uh, 650 grams so even less than the maple version and that is why I made the decision to uh, 3D print the largest subcontrabassoon uh, body joints. The, the joints that don't have a lot of key work on them. So if we look... Here... Um, so the subcontrabassoon has... Uh, or my plan has kind of five main vertical segments here. So there's the, what I'm calling the wing section, which has most of the left hand, or all the left hand key work. There's the first boot section, which has all the right hand key work. And those sections, I'm going to continue with the plan of machining them out of Delrin. Because these have all of, the, all of the key work. So I want that extra security. But if we go further down, 
this is the second boot section, we see that the key work is very sparse. You know, just the, the three tone holes with pads and then the base section here and finally the bell section. Um, and yeah, so, uh, since these are, uh, kind of less involved, I felt that the weight reduction w meant that 3d printing wasn't a, uh, kind of a shortcut to producing a prototype. It was actually the best way to make a plastic, uh, prototype, uh, subcontrabassoon. And uh, of course, there's also the uh, the bends. So we have that bend here. Which you can see a version of it in real life here. Now, you may have noticed on the table behind me, there are a lot of, there are a lot of pieces and there's actually pretty much two full sets of, um, uh, of these nine body joints. Um, and that's because I, well, these, this is all a learning process and I ended up changing my mind on something. So initially, so this, this joint right here, this is, uh, printed in uh, plastic called PLA, polylactic acid, extremely popular in the in three D printing because it's ridiculously easy to work with. Um, it sticks to the bed perfectly. It um, it doesn't. It's not overly picky about uh, the temperature of the build chamber. And that's initially what I was using, and that is what I used for the the serpent and the racket. Um, but as I assembled these uh, sub, uh, subcontrabassoon joints, uh, they're too long or they're too tall to print in one piece. So I divided them in thirds. Um, I began to, uh, to encounter the big problem with PLA, and that is that it's uh, pretty resistant to glue. Um, so I was using um, you know, various glues and they work okay, but it never, it still, it, it's not, it doesn't really become one piece. And that's what I was really looking for. So all those assemble joints, those are in PLA. Um, and it was a, a interesting and informative proof of concept but the, these, uh, the shorter joints you see behind me that aren't assembled yet, that's the reprint when I uh, reprinted everything in ABS. ABS is the material that, um, that Lego bricks are made out of, and it has a lot of advantages on a PLA. It's slightly lighter, it's considerably stronger and less brittle, um, but the most important consideration is that it can be, um, it's not as resistant as glue. In fact, if you use a slurry of uh, ABS and acetone, you can more or less chemically weld these pieces together so that they become, for all practical purposes, one solid piece. And that's what I was really looking for. And that's why I decided to reprint everything in uh, ABS. I think some people are wanting to see a closer look of the bell. This is the this is the PL, PLA bell. So this will go down as a prototype, not part or as a experiment, not part of the uh, finished prototype. And you'll see I I'm going to have a full set of those. Uh, well, actually, that's not quite true. I ended up. Uh, uh, I visited Brett Newton uh, a few uh, month or so ago when we were we did a road trip to pick up a Sarusa phone, and I uh, ended up giving him the um, 
the uh, the PLA test print of uh, what I'm the uh, the body joint that I'm going to call here if we look over here the uh, the Newton joint the second to last body joint so I thought he might enjoy having that Um, and actually here, here's an, if, uh, for those of you who aren't on my, uh, who don't, uh, follow my, uh, fa uh the Subcontrabassoon Facebook page, here is, well, where is it? Okay, sorry about this. I thought I got all of those, all of the images I was going to want easily accessible, but apparently I missed the one image I wanted more to show you all more than any other. Um, so let's pull that up. Uh, yeah, Jacob, that that's... Exactly the image I'd like I wanted to show you is the uh, kind of a rough assembly of the PLA test prints. Uh, which is not for some crazy reason on my phone. Okay. Well, if this is the worst part of the stream, I will consider it a success. But uh, here we go. Okay, so yeah, this is the the uh, the pieces of the um, the PLA test print subcontrabassoon, uh, along kind of placed in their general location alongside a contrabassoon, so you can kind of see it all together. Um, Now, um, at the same time, um, as I began uh, printing these, uh, there's, there's another, um, so kind of the most important parts as far as the structure of the instrument are the, um, the body joints themselves and the, uh, the frame assembly. So if we... here so if we uh, look here 
the uh, the frame assembly is this metal assembly that kind of holds everything together. So we have a piece on top, a piece on bottom that holds the end pin, and then a column connecting the two. So before I can think, or before I can start kind of assembling things and putting the instrument in kind of a, a uh, an assembly that kind of looks like the finished instrument, I need um, these frame pieces. So, so these are some of these pieces. Uh, these were laser cut. Uh, I don't have a, a laser cutter, so I had to outsource that out to someone else. So, so this is the the top frame, no, sorry, <laughs> uh, this is the bottom frame. There's going to be a U-bin suspended here and a U-bin suspended here. So like this on the bottom of the instrument. And then a top frame that's going to have the other three bins. So, something like that on top. However, I didn't want to have to disassemble the entire instrument anytime I want to take it, take it uh, apart or anytime I need to get to the inside. So I mercilessly stole an idea from the, the Fox contrabassoons. Instead of having the bins directly uh, on these top frames, each bend has its own little metal frame. So like that. And then that is going to bolt onto these frames with a gasket in between. That way, if for whatever reason I need to get inside of the instrument, I can remove one or any one of the um, bins at a time without completely disassembling the entire instrument. Now the, so this, these were all uh, laser cut. And so there's more uh, of these little bend frames here. But uh, the most uh, complicated part was the, uh, the end pin uh, assembly. And that looks like this. Now, I don't have a CNC lathe. So if you look closely, you can see that this curve here is a little bit lumpy, but the curve isn't important. What's important is that this part of the end pin assembly, or a receiver is robust so that it can accept these threads, whereas this part is thinner, and that's so if I... I don't have a thumb screw for it yet, but if I tighten down this, this um, screw here, this uh, end pin no longer moves at all. And that's not being held by friction. That's uh, being supported positively by the threads. Um, and that was, I felt like that was important because there's going to be a lot of weight resting on this end pin. Um, and I didn't want, uh, 
I mean, I think anyone who's played kind of a large musical instrument, a contrabassoon, a bass clarinet, a contrabass clarinet, knows what it feels like when those little tiny end pins that are just held up by friction collapses on you in the middle of playing. It's terrible, terrible. Um, now, I've someone asked why the end pin is angled like that. And before we talk about that, I do think I was kind of, um, I felt like it was interesting how I ended up making this weird angle. Um, so, So this is just an alignment jig that I 3D printed just to put this in the right alignment. So it'll look like that. And then we have these truss pieces here to further support it. So this will be kind of the, the bottom end pin assembly. Now the reason it's angled like this um, is because I wanted to put the contact, the ground contact as uh, close to underneath the center of gravity as possible. Um, that way, I mean, once again, there's a lot of weight here and the less pressure, the less of the weight is, that's kind of being, that you have to support as the player, the better. Um, but because that's at a weird angle, it did require some extra trusses and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, but this this piece right here, um, machining this exact angle. Um, well, I could have spent a lot of time moving the headstock on the mill at exactly the right angle. And then a lot of a lot of time later to get it perfectly square. But what I actually ended up doing was a little bit less conventional. I 3D printed this custom clamp block. So this piece fits perfectly in there and then it holds it at exactly the angle it needs to be. And I was able to put this in the vise in the mill to, to machine that angle without having to, to spend, you know, a whole bunch of time re-squaring the entire mill. So this is probably one of the most comp, uh, complex machining parts on the instrument. So having that done is a great load off. Um, so what's going to come next is if you look at these Uh, this, uh, these frame assemblies, you'll see that there's these tenons. Uh, and those tenons are going to uh, be on the other side of the frame from the bends and that's what's going to hold the body joints together. So those are considerably less complicated to machine. Um, and most of them I can make out of pipe. Uh, by the way, um, some of you may have already noticed, uh, woodwinds, uh, musical instruments tend to use a lot of brass. This, these frames are actually ma are made out of stainless steel. Um, I, I went back and forth a lot on whether or not to use brass or stainless steel for the frames, uh, but in the end I decided the extra rigidity of stainless steel would be worth the kind of somewhat more difficult process of uh, welding them together. Anyway, so that's going to be the next big project is making these tenons for the frame 
and then getting these frames welded together. Um, and when that's done, I can uh, get a lot closer to seeing the instrument kind of all together in one piece. Now, one of the big unexciting uh, changes or unexciting pieces of progress I made this year is so as I've been working on the project, kind of a continual issue is in my line of work, I tend to either have time or money, um, but not both. So if I'm driving back and forth to Tulsa four times a week for symphony rehearsals, I'm making money, but I don't have time to be in the shop. But if I have like a couple weeks off, um, I have time but not money so what i've been trying to do a better job of now this year especially is as i do have extra uh as i when i do have you know plenty of work to keep me busy i'm trying to stockpile raw materials so that later on i can uh i already have the materials i need so that's where all this heavy-duty stainless steel pipe came from. This is kind of interesting. Oh! This is an entire subcontrabassoon worth of hinge rod. This kind of heavy-duty nickel-silver um, rod that you use to make um, uh, 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 keys, kind of like the, the long vertical parts of, of the keys. So I already have that. And various other key components, hinge tube, uh, arbor stock. Um, and oddly enough, one of the most uh, significant uh, costs, like of actual raw material, are these. So these are key, uh, key posts. And I picked these up when I was at Fox uh, at, on the way back from a trip to uh, Toronto. So a whole bunch of key posts and pivot screws and all of these kind of, I mean, they're not terribly expensive. I, you know, Fox is a wonderful company. Most companies, if they if you tried to tell them, hey, I want to buy 80 of your posts, they would just tell you no. Fox just gives you a price, and it's either a price you're willing to pay or it's not. And for me, it ended up uh, being worth it to not have to make 80 of these things myself. Now, you may be wondering, um, since I'm 3D printing some of these body joints, not all, but some, how am I going to connect these posts to the instrument itself, to the body of the instrument? Now, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't be a good idea to just tap directly into the 3D printed um, um, body of the instrument because, because once again, it's not solid through, throughout. So what I'm doing is, and actually you can see it here. So this is a low A bell that I'm working on on my contour bassoon. And this one's actually gonna have key work. So you can see that there's a couple of posts, or four posts already here. And rather than tapping into the, the uh, the body of the instrument, 
I'm using what are called heat set inserts. So they kind of look like this and you get them hot, hot enough to, to lightly melt the plastic and then you force them into these holes and you, you know, prepare in advance exactly the right size hole. Um, and then that gives you secure threads in 3D printed parts. So that's what I'm going to be doing there. I'm trying to think if what else? Oh, uh, uh, Kaiden was asking about, uh, do I need to use larger key posts? Um, the, the subcontra bassoon key work is not really that crazy, um, compared to some of the keys that are already on contra bassoon, as far as size, as far as length is concerned. Uh, so I'm using just standard uh, contra bassoon, or Fox uses the, the, the same posts for bassoon and contra bassoon. Sorry, I think I'm rumpling those right in the microphone. That's probably all you're hearing right now. So yes, I'm using standard bassoon, contra bassoon posts um, and standard uh, contra bassoon uh, 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 key rod material. Um, and that's uh, 3 sixteenths of an inch. Okay, uh, trying to think. So, that's kind of an overview of what I've done in uh, 2019. Uh, looking ahead to 2020, uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, Jared brought up an interesting point. Um, and that is when you have very long let me get those again. When you have very long um, key uh, keys like this, you can see that there's a good deal of flex. And there, there's no way around that. Um, Every material is, uh, is a compromise. Uh, there's not a perfectly rigid and perfectly strong material. In fact, usually you have to trade off a little bit of flexibility for less brittleness. So let's take, uh, for example, the, uh, the low A flat key on the subcontra bassoon. Um, This isn't going to be the exact correct tone hole position, but it'll give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Well, I've managed to put some that don't go together, but, oh, no. Okay, so this is the height of a subconscious and body joint, and the low A flat key covers almost that entire length. The key has to be down here, and the tone hole is way up there. So, if you were to just take like a one meter long piece of key stock, it would be flexing all over the place. Um, a slight bump could knock it out entirely. Um, so what I did is, let's open up that, yes. So if we look at this key, so we can see the A flat key here, and then there's a short tube here, and then this is the beginning of that long tube right here, and then it goes all the way up here. But rather than have one really long rod, I divided that rod into three segments. Uh, no no subcontra bassoon key 
is longer than what you would find on a contrabassoon. Uh, anytime it needed to be longer than that, I divided it up into multiple segments. Um, and what the, the mm, in addition to flexing, the other thing you have to worry about is just the uh, thermal expansion properties of the different materials. So metal, uh, nickel silver expands differently under heat than plastic or maple. So when you have something that's like two meters long, that the difference can make a big can be a big deal. Um, it can make it can make the difference between a key kind of um, if the uh, if the uh, the plastic expands uh, more than the metal, then that means that it's going to the pivot screws are going to it's going to get looser and then possibly even pop out. Um, and if the wood expands less than the metal, that means that as it changes temperature, it can bind. So by dividing it into multiple segments, I uh, kind of take that, that error, that, that the, uh, the, little, the, the amount of slop you need to account for the, the differences in thermal expansion and divide that in two or three. So, um, first of all, real quick, does anyone have any questions about uh, kind of what what I've d talked about so far? It's kind of the, the progress I've made this year and then before going into kind of future plans. Okay, uh, uh, Theo, Theo asked about um, controlling some of the uh, some of the the lowest keys, and if I Open this up again. So right now the plan is still actually here. I have, I have a better idea. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, Avery asked, are there any companies interested in making it? I know for a fact there are companies that are interested in seeing what happens um, uh, with my prototype. Uh, but I, I view this less as a uh, business proposition and more of a science project. Um, Right now, there's not enough market for subcontrabassoons for a company who's, I mean, it's nothing wrong. Their goal, it's their company. Their, make, their goal is to make profit. And right now, um, there's just not the market for it. So maybe over the court, you know, if, I, if, if uh, I'm able to make a prototype and it's worthwhile, composers start using it, performers want to play it, maybe other companies will be more interested in uh, the idea. Uh, anyway, okay. So. So, the, uh, these lowest body joints. Well, that's not helpful. Um, so these lowest keys, if you look here, you'll see what kind of look like bicycle cables. And that's uh, exactly what they are, Bowden cables. Um, for a couple key connections that would be incredibly complicated, 
and prone to go out of adjustment if they were used or using traditional keys. Uh, that's what I used for, for five of them. See, uh, for example, let's take here. This is the this is the bis or the key connection for the low F key, which closes the low G tone hole. The tone hole itself is way at the top of the instrument, whereas the key, uh, sorry, it's way at the top of the instrument and it's on a bend, whereas the key. To operate it is way down sorry it's a little difficult to see is way down here so that helps our using uh, Bowden cables drastically reduces the complexity of getting from there from one place to the other okay so will there be a complete wood sop contrabassoon i designed it in such a way that there can be and i would like there to be um but i, w I need to prove that the concept itself I'm not Fox. I don't have a warehouse full of already aged maple. Um, so, I'm sorry. I've, okay, yeah. Uh, I don't have a warehouse full of already aged maple. So, I, I'm of the belief that the, um, the material of the body is much less important than the properties of the bore itself. Um, so I do believe that a plastic uh, prototype subcontrabassoon could adequately demonstrate the value of the instrument um, well enough to for people to figure out whether or not a wooden subcontrabassoon is justifiable. However, having said that, I do kind of feel like for the bins... Uh, 3D printed plastic might be just the way to go with the bins uh, because this is a complicated shape um, that it helps if it's light. Um, and, you know, if, you've, if you look at the top bend of a um, contrabassoon or actually even just the... Where is it? There we go. Or even kind of this plan. It it has to be made in two halves and then sealed and then kind of uh, screwed together with, with seams. So that adds a lot of metal um, and it's still two separate pieces. Whereas 3D printing it in ABS, you can chemically weld that together and it's like one solid piece. Um, so I'm, I'm not at all convinced that uh, plastic isn't just the best way to make these bins. Um, you know, and if we think about the contrabassoon, the, the bins are usually made out of whatever material is easiest. Um, so if you're making like 20 contrabassoons a year, it's easier to just have some sa or outsource some saxophone maker to make uh, metal bins for you. Uh, same thing with the bell. But for me, the easiest way to make those sorts of shapes is probably ABS. Same thing with the bell. Um, the, the big advantage of uh, metal is that it's relatively lightweight, and it's easy to make these complicated shapes. But the 3D printed version isn't any heavier, and it's just as easy to make these complicated shapes. And if you make it out of ABS, you can uh, 
uh, uh, kind of uh, weld it together easily. So uh, once again, I'm not as certain that it will be necessary or it would be um, it would be better. Uh, sorry, I'm not at all certain that it would be better to make the bins out of wood and the bell out of metal is what I'm really trying to get at. Uh, Bob asks, how did you come up with the precise measurements for bore and taper? Uh, this is something Brett and I have actually talked about. My, my logic was I wanted to make a subcontrabassoon that fit into the bassoon family. So as my kind of guide, I, I went off of the difference between the bassoon and the contrabassoon, and I tried to extrapolate that to a subcontrabassoon. Um, okay. Oh, yes. Uh, NPC <laughs> asked me if I used Blender for CAD. Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, Blender is a wonderful program and it's free and I use it for like pretty animations and um, uh, that kind of stuff but for CAD it's awful um, I'm, I'm lucky my dad has a metal fabrication shop which is also where I get access to some of these tools um, and he has Autodesk Inventor and when I worked there for several years uh, after college, uh, I, I, I used a lot of I used a lot of Inventor working for him. Um, so that's the the software I'm using. Yeah, uh, Autodesk Inventor, not 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 Blender. Um, unfortunately, with CAD, I just don't know that there is a open source fully functioning uh, parametric model uh, CAD program. Uh, if there is, I would love to hear about it. But everything I've ever tried is is awful. Um, and once again, I'm lucky. For the people who don't have access to um, uh, CAD software at a university or through an employer, it's it's rough because the free options just aren't very good. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ryan, uh, Caden is right. Uh, Kaiden, Caden. Sorry if I mispronounced. Um, uh, I designed this to be played sitting. Uh, in fact, here, I can show you an image of what it kind of looks like in playing position. So this is not, this is the, uh, one of the first things I 3D printed was an ergonomics test. I just wanted to get a feel for where the key work was and how it felt in your, in your hands. Um, so it's as tall, it's that tall. It's pretty tall, but it's not as, I mean, historically contrabassoons were a lot taller than this, or considerably taller than this. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of overall what it'll look like when uh, it's finished. And I'm one of the reasons I'm looking forward to finishing the frame is so that I can put this together um, and uh, with the the actual body joints. So it's not these weird spindly uh, wooden things to kind of hold these uh, these uh, ergonomic models together. Yeah, uh, Griffin, um, it's a very valid concern. So personally, I feel like the um, it you it takes advantage. The reason why I think the subcontrabassoon is a better um, or more likely to succeed concept than like a subcontrabass saxophone or a subcontrabass flute or a subcontrabass tuba is precisely because the bassoon is more conservative with its air requirements and its uh, its bore taper. Um, so my hope is that 
um, that that will make it uh, a little a little easier to play. And you know, I've I've played down to low E on contrabassoon with my ridiculous extensions. Um, so adding a few more notes at the bottom with a reed that's actually you know designed to support those notes, I, I'm optimistic that it'll it'll work. And once again, this is a science project. So if if the end of the day we learn that well, it's not going to work or I can play like a quarter note. Um, I mean, it's going to be disappointing, but it's more information than we knew going into it. I don't think that will be the case, but thankfully I have not talked the advantage of running things the way that I have, you know, as opposed to going out to a bank and trying to get a giant loan to start a company to manufacture these things um, is if the worst happens... I, you know, my life isn't ruined. Okay, so uh, what's, we talked a lot, or we talked about kind of where we're at now. Um, and so what are the next plans? Um, so kind of uh, right now, my main focus is to get the, um, to get the frames ready to go. Once the frames are ready to go, I can start assembling things, seeing how it, it feels, looks, balance. I mean, you know, I can go into my CAD software and tell it to show me where the center of or center of gravity is, but that's very different than feeling it in your hands. So that's my, my top goal right now. Uh, machining those tenons for the other part of these. I need to, right here, I have a whole bunch of threaded studs uh, that need to be uh, welded or soldered uh, onto these frames. And that's actually the, the biggest question I have right now is I, I've gone back and forth like 20 times on how to assemble these stainless steel parts. Um, whether to weld them or solder them. Um, both have their drawbacks. Uh, soldering isn't going to be quite as strong, um, but welding is also introduces a lot more heat and you can end up with warping. Um, I have... Yeah, it... It's, it's not a completely decided. Uh, if I had to guess, what I'm probably going to do is weld the lower frame with the end pin because that's going to support everything. Um, and solder the upper bend and kind of use that as a test to see if if one approach is just not going to be uh, effective or not going to be, uh, I mean, welding or soldering, either one's going to hold the, the pieces together. It's a matter of how well it holds it together and how, if it, if there's any warpage in the process. Um, then after that, I need to start assembling all these um, segments. And that's actually not that complicated. Um, so all I have to do is uh, I have a big granite block with some sandpaper. So sand that perfectly smooth. Um, and these are also uh, all a little bit long. So that'll, that'll also give me the um, the flexibility to uh, sand it to exactly the right length. Um, and if you look, I don't know if this will show up, but you'll see there's all of these um, holes on the top and the bottom of each piece. And those are for alignment pins. Um, uh, I use uh, some lengths of nylon filament to, to go here or to go all, all around. 
just so that when I'm putting it together, it's I guarantee that it's in alignment. And you, you can also notice, if you look closely, that it's a perfect pattern of eight, except one is weird. And that, trust me, I learned that the wrong way, or the, the hard way to add kind of one offset uh, pin. That way you can, you know that it's it can only be assembled in the correct way. Mm. Yeah, Bob, uh, tubas, tubas can play down to C0. The question is, can tuba players play down there? Um, there, you're really dealing with the limitations of human anatomy because your lip is functioning as the reed, and lips only come in a relatively small number of sizes. So, yes, the tuba can play down there, but I, I think... Most tuba players would acknowledge that that is not what it's designed for or what it's good at. Okay, so uh, assemble all these uh, body joints. I'm also gonna, you know, sand the inside smooth. Uh, you know, this is not, the goal is that this is not a, uh, a test piece, that this is gonna be part of the finished prototype. So I wanna do everything I can to make these pieces as good as possible. Um, I've also, you might notice that there's a little bit of ugliness on the overhangs on these tone holes. And I knew that that was gonna happen, which is why I undersized all these tone holes uh, just a little bit so that I can ream them out to the final dimension. Um, someone asked a, an interesting question. Uh, how much filament did I go through on this? Um, each version, the PLA and the ABS print, took about eight kilograms of filament, uh, which is, you know, like 150 bucks, um, which is, you know, it's not cheap, but it's, and once again, this is not the reason I did it, uh, but it is a lot less expensive than I was going to spend on Delrin if I had done it the uh, the way I had originally intended, you know, machine uh, using a subtractive manufacturing out of a solid piece of Delrin rather than the additive manufacturing of um, 3D printing. Um, yeah, so, and then of course, there's the, uh, the elephant in the room is those, the six body joints that are not 3D printed. Um, So the, uh, the wing section and the, the upper boot section. And this is, for a while, I wasn't able to make any progress on these because, well, it's not that I wasn't, oh, okay. Uh, the, the short version of the story is that I had made, one of the first things I did on the project was make a custom steady rest for these pieces because you can't use a, when you're putting something like this on a lathe, uh, you can't use a center if you're trying to bore the inside. Um, it has to be, it has to be uh, supported from the outside. So we made this, you know, kind of heavy duty, specifically designed um, uh, steady rest uh, to support these pieces when they're being turned. Um, but somehow some very important parts of it went missing when someone was cleaning, you know, uh, a temp was cleaning the shop. Um, and those were missing for a long time and remaking them was possible, but it was just a step that I hadn't gotten around to doing. Luckily we found those pieces finally. Um, and, uh, so if you've seen the, the video on the, the body joints, uh, the first body joints video, so those pieces are still in process and returning to, or getting those finished, um, it's a lot less intimidating to get those six body joints finished than it is to make all, uh, all of those other body joints. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um... 
So I'm trying to think if there's anything. Oh, yeah. So the other thing that um, I'm going to want to do pretty soon is if we look over here to the, the tube, what I call the tube section, uh, this is the part of the instrument that's used for harmonic vents and to receive the vocal. And so I have the material for that. Um, I'm going to... Uh, probably water jet cut those pieces because they're all like you know very slight cones uh, so I think water jet cutting will be accurate enough it'll be I think laser cutting would be needlessly expensive but trying to do it by hand would be uh, a little bit uh, wonky so that's what this sheet of nickel silver is for it's for making those um, uh, that tube segment Um, yeah. Uh, when did I start the sub contrabassoon project? I did, 20, like Christmas 2014, maybe? I, it may be going on five years. Um, but yeah, uh, this is not a. You know, it, it's kind of frustrating uh, sometimes, like, okay. Sorry, I'll... So if you've watched uh, some of my more recent videos, you may have seen this instrument. This is the world's first Sopranino Crumhorn in G. Uh, I had the idea to make this and then like 24 hours later, I was playing it. I wish that could be the case with the sub but the sub uh, the sub is, uh, it's a lot of pieces. The more pieces you have, the tighter the tolerances have to be in order for everything to fit together well. Um, and yeah, it's just... It's there. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of pieces, and trying to do it all the right way so that when the prototype is finished, I can present to the world kind of the the best the best version of a subcontrabassoon prototype I can produce. Because otherwise, I could end up damaging the project more than I am helping it. Okay. Arr. What was I? Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Approximate length of the vocal. Here, I actually have a good picture to show you. Um, so, for the same reason the contrabassoon vocal isn't twice as long as a bassoon vocal, because that would be um, difficult to manufacture. The sub contrabassoon vocal isn't going to be twice as long as a contrabassoon vocal. In fact, it's only going to be slightly longer. Um, this is for kind of ease of manufacturing. Um, you know, a vocal is already, even a bassoon vocal is already a pretty fragile uh, construction. Um, so the longer you make it, um, the, the greater the risk of it being kind of crumpled or bent. Um, I did end up making it a little bit longer than a contrabassoon vocal, though, because um, the other advantage of the vocal is that you can switch them out to different lengths. Uh, you know, if, I don't know, if you live in Europe and your orchestra plays at like 445, you can use a different length vocal than here in the U.S. where we nominally use 440, or at least most of the orchestras do. Um, but as the instruments get lower, the difference necessary to make that tuning shift grows. 
Um, so if if you needed a bocal that was, uh, let's say, three millimeters shorter on bassoon, you would need a bocal that was 12 millimeters shorter on subcontra bassoon. So if I made the bocal too short, then I could introduce some kind of wild changes of taper um, if I ever needed to make long or shorter vocals for overseas. Um, uh, so, oh yeah, uh, Christian. Uh, so the... The problem here is that kind of like on most musical instruments, the most significant source of uh, cost is the labor involved, not necessarily the materials. Um, so ye yes, if I were to sell instruments and uh, decided to use 3D printing for some of those body joints, kind of those, the, the, the bigger body joints with less material, um, it would probably be slightly less expensive, but not, not as much as, um, not like an order of magnitude less expensive. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Like, once again, my, my number one goal is getting the prototype playable, and then seeing where the business decisions might go from there. Uh, so Ryan wants to know what inspired me to create this subcontrabassoon. It's actually, I wish I still had it. Um, when I was a kid, I had a Guinness Book of World Records. And in this Guinness Book of World Records, it lists, you know, the low, it listed the lowest instruments in the world. Uh, it listed the, you know, the, the organ in, in Sydney, with the, the 64 foot stop, it listed the octo contrabass clarinet that LeBlanc made. That, in the uh, according to the um, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, I had it went down to B flat negative one. Modern research suggests that it was probably uh, C zero, uh, so keyed down to low D. Um, the uh, but it also listed a sub contrabassoon um, by a uh, company made Cherverny, and in fact there was a uh, a sub contrabassoon made by Cherverny um, for them to make this confusion. However, it did not. It wasn't a full octave below the contrabassoon. It was simply. It was more or less a metal contrabassoon or a, a metal reed contrabass that went a little bit lower. The, the lowest note of the Cherverny sub contrabassoon was A0, the same as a contrabassoon with a low A. Um, but this kind of idea, this myth passed, passed around the, the music world back in the days when it was a lot easier or a lot more difficult to research this kind of thing. And so... When I when I got to college, I was excited to finally play the sub contrabassoon because surely I'm at a small university in Arkansas and they're going to have you know a sub contrabassoon. Why wouldn't they? Um, but uh, so you know when my when my teacher told me that he didn't think that that was real, you know I went to the library to try to prove him wrong, and then well, he was right. It never the 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 idea that the Guinness Book of World Records had led me to believe never existed, and I spent a couple generate or a couple decades waiting for someone to make one, and eventually I got tired of waiting and said, "Well, if no one else is going to, then I guess I'm going to." Um, I, I don't know. You you can only there's only so long you can wait. For someone else to do something um, and as it happened I had some of the relevant skills um, so uh, uh, experience with CAD a professional contrabassoonist so there are better people than me to do this project but for whatever reason and once again no 
Uh, no one owes the world a subcontra bassoon. Um, so if I was the the most... If I was the person who wanted to see it the most, then it kind of made sense for me to be the one to to, to take the plunge and uh, try to make it a reality. Uh, did I enjoy playing Jingle Bells with the Texarkana Symphony? <laughs> Yeah, f uh, f for, for those of you who don't know, I recently drove five hours down to Texarkana to play Jingle Bells. Not not even the most ridiculous gig I've had on Contrabassoon. Um, I once played two notes. Uh, the uh, the Corn Gold Violin Concerto has a second bassoon slash contrabassoon part, and I played... Just the contrabassoon part, ver, part uh, just the parts that were on contrabassoon, which were two notes in the second movement, two low G's. Oh well. Okay. So, I think I'm trying to trying to decide if there's anything I've forgotten. Um, does Does anyone have any last questions about kind of? What the what the goals are in the future, uh, kind of like our medium term goals. Obviously, the final goal is finishing the instrument, uh, finishing the prototype, and actually getting to play some stuff. Because, uh, you know, I didn't really think I would be in this position, but there are there are pieces that are already written that include a sub contrabassoon part. You know, I I had originally had this, you know, when I was just getting ready to go public with the project, I had this kind of speech in my head about how, well, it's okay that there are no parts for subcontrabassoon because you have to build the instrument first. You know, expecting there or waiting to build an instrument after there are parts written for it's, you know, putting the cart before the horse. And then, like two days before I went public with the project, someone composed, uh, someone had heard through the grapevine and uh, composed uh, a piece for it. Uh, Robert Rennes uh, composed a, a little quintet uh, for three bassoons, contrabassoon and subcontrabassoon. So as long as the subcontrabassoon project has been public, there have been pieces that use it. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, Brett's included it on um, uh, two of his symphonies. Uh, there's a little uh, serenade by a German composer named Matthias Hutter. Um, so yeah, I want to I want to play some of that stuff. Um, uh, yeah, so commissions are uh, something I'd very much like to do, but right now any money that I have that I could spend on commissions, or I feel like is going to be better spent getting the inch, getting the prototype finished. Um, Uh, what's my largest deterrent to completion? Um, honestly, at this point, I have most of the raw materials. Um, so the biggest deterrent is time. Uh, just finding days in the shop. And, you know, it's not quite as simple as, oh, I have two hours free today. Uh, I'm going to go to the shop. Two hours in a shop means that you... When, when, you, when you're working in a shop, ideally you want to have enough time to, to get something significant accomplished. Otherwise, you're spending almost all your time getting set up. Or even worse, you're spending all your time getting started, and then you, you don't quite finish, and then you have to go, and then by the time you get there again, someone else has already gotten on the lathe and changed everything. And um, Yeah, so it, right now the biggest deterrent is just time, you know, balancing the the work that I have to do to keep a roof over my head with the work I'm doing just because I feel like it needs to be done. Uh I I I'm not I'm not making firm estimates on when it will be completed. Um I will say that I would absolutely love to have a playable prototype to bring to Iowa City this summer for the IDRS convention, uh, which is gonna would take a lot of work to to get that done in that amount of time. Um, 
So that's kind of, that's a goal of mine, but it's, it's not, it's not a, it's, it's not a promise. Um, and as for cost, once again, I want to get everything finished and then be able to add it up rather than just kind of throw out some kind of arbitrary number. The, once again, the big raw materials, I could, you know, I could calculate that in an afternoon. The biggest thing though is the, the, the labor, the time. You know, if I were to sell a subcontra bassoon, I would need to, you know, make sure that I'm making at least a minimum wage while doing it. Um, and that's something that I'm going to have a much better understanding of after uh, the, the prototype is complete. Uh, if I ha so Bob asks, uh, if I, if I had a big bucket of money, I'd say no to gigs and spend your time working on the subcon, on the subcontrasoon project. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, so there are two orchestras that I'm kind of a member of. Uh, I am, I am the contrabassoonist with the Tulsa Symphony and the contrabassoonist with the Symphony Northwest Arkansas. And the, both the, both of those organizations are extremely important to me, um, both professionally and personally. So I wouldn't be quitting those orchestras. Um, if I did have just a big bundle of money, um, I it would give me more flexibility to turn down, you know, some some sub work, you know, less. You know, I love playing contra bassoon but not all gigs are created equal and there's some gigs that you know i'm mainly accepting for you know, the, the the paycheck rather than the artistic experience of playing the piece um so i guess i'd probably accept less of those but you also have to if you want to keep subbing with orchestras you also have to maintain positive relationships and if you're constantly turning down work they're not going to hold it against you but eventually they're just going to find someone else um, so yes, I would probably be accepting fewer gigs, but not a lot fewer. Start a Patreon. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have thought about it, but it's the, the thing about Patreon is you're, I feel like the right way to do Patreon is to do kind of like to have a very to have a schedule of content that you're producing and releasing. And in order to do that with the subconscious project, I would I would feel like I'd be sacrificing the work on the project in favor of the work for, you know, keeping the, you know, supporters happy, um, or making the supporters, give, giving them kind of, you know, what they paid for, I guess I should say. Um, so I've kind of purposefully stuck to kind of a, a contribution model of just, Hey, if, if you really feel like contributing, you can, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to be pushy. I'm not going to, you know, make it seem like this is why I'm doing it. Uh, the initial, you know, plan when I went public was it was a um, uh, an Indiegogo campaign, you know, and I kind of set a goal of if I raise this much amount of money, then I could pretty much just take a few months off and do that. Um, and it didn't end up reaching that goal because, I mean, it's a very niche project. Uh, camp or it's a very niche project so you know that's not that big of a surprise and everyone who you know contributed on that initial in sorry everyone who contributed on that initial indiegogo you know was uh refunded because it didn't meet the goal that was one of the main reasons why i chose indiegogo was because i didn't want to like get i don't know half of the goal and then only get that much and then not have enough to kind of stop everything and finish it now, but also not have enough to, to, 
I didn't want to be stuck in the middle where I felt like I, you know, owed people a lot, but I didn't have enough to, to get it done on a, on a good time frame. Uh, how different is the key work of the subcontra bassoon from the contra bassoon? Well, here I can. Pictures and video. Let's, uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, yeah. So while, while I'm pulling this up, uh, Ryan, if I were to work with another company, if, uh, if I were to work for, uh, work with another company, um, I don't know. It would. So this is something Brett and I have talked about a lot is, you know, kind of long distance collaborations on musical instruments. And I've always been kind of on the more skeptical side of, you know, running these sorts of projects um, over the um, over long distance can be. Um, can be uh, frustra or frustrating and you know maybe probably maybe not the, the the best way to go about it um, so if it were in order for me to, to work with another company it would need to be someplace that I could actually you know go and work with um, so that would kind of limit it to the American companies you know once again, I, I know I've said a lot of great things about Fox, but I really do like the company. The, the The people there are great. It's very tinker friendly. So, you know, if the prototype were to become successful and Fox were to, you know, be interested in, in that, you know, that's certainly a conversation I would love to have. However, Fox is very much a company. And, you know, they're also, as far as what they actually make, they're on, on the more conservative side. You know, they, they make good bassoons, they make good oboes, they make good English horns, they make good contra bassoons, and they, they kind of stick with that. And that's okay. But I, I don't think it would... I, I personally doubt they would ever be interested in kind of the, the sub-contra bassoon, or making one themselves. I know for a fact that many of the people that work for Fox are excited to, to, uh, to see what happens. Um... But uh, as far as making it themselves, I, I don't see it. Um, and other than that, you know, it it, it just kind of would depend. I I would say there aren't any there aren't any ba uh, bassoon manufacturers that I have that I would you know like purposefully stay away from if they were to you know talk to me earnestly about it. Okay, so uh, someone had a question about the subcontrabassoon key work. So it's very similar to contrabassoon. Um, the here, where is? Well, that's not helpful. Okay. So if we look at the uh, kind of the right hand, we have the normal key work you would expect. Um, it's very, the, for the prototype, it's going to be very basic. Not a lot of extra um, uh, gizmos or alternate keys. You know, first finger, second finger, third finger, no alternate B flat key. Um, no alternate F sharp, just the low F and the low A flat key. Uh, then for the the right thumb, once again, low E, low F sharp, low B flat, not a lot of 
uh, extra stuff. The one kind of unconventional key I'm planning on adding on the prototype is this key right here, which is a third harmonic vent key um, designed to help it get up to the, uh, hopefully the high C or high B flat. Uh, the The fact that the subcontrapuntum is so long makes it uh, easier to position some of these third harmonic vents without having them to be on the vocal. Uh, let's see, and then we have, what is this one? Okay, so this is the, uh, the left hand key work. So this is the, the only E flat key I'm gonna add on the prototype. Um, uh, then the E F sharp trill key, not a terribly critical key, but one I'm gonna put on the prototype just to make, sh so that I can test the position of the tone hole. And then the E flat, C sharp, and the, the low A key down here. Uh, and then, let's see, where is left thumb? That's not good. No. Nope. All right, and left thumb key work, Pretty conventional, low B flat, low B, low C, low D, uh, the C sharp key, the and then the two octave keys. Um, on the, the prototype, my first plan is to make kind of a simple harmonic system, um, uh, harmonic vent system, uh, similar to contrabassoon, two, uh, two octave keys. Um, because of the extra length of the instrument, I think that there's a pretty good chance that that's not going to be adequate, but I want to make sure the simple solution doesn't work, doesn't work before um, modifying it and adding, a, you know, like a third octave key or an, an uh, automatic octave system or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Bob, I, I completely get that concern. And I guess my feeling on that matter is if I don't want to put people in a situation where they're not, you know, I think if, like in my case, I'm a little concerned about, you know, having to spend a lot more time on uh, like commitment to Patreon perks and other people's concern about, you know, giving someone a, a big wad of money and then not having oversight on how they, how exactly they use it. In my mind, that's a good reason why, you know, or that, that, that's a equate, or that's a situation that's best handled by not, neither person getting financially involved with the other. And you know, like like I said, I I'm trying. I've tried to, I've tried to keep the contribution thing very low key. Try to you know not not push it because once again, I don't want to. I don't want. It's one thing for people to, to. To you know be. Mm, it's one thing for people to be excited about the project and, you know, want it to happen quicker. It's another thing if you've kind of implied promises for, you know, of um, how quickly things are going to move and accepting money. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, once again, the, I, 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 I'm trying to think of this as a science project first and foremost, and anyone who has contributed, I'm incredibly thankful for that. Um, but I, I feel like if I kind of keep it on the, not have that be the primary goal of my content and, you know, it, it's a little, it's harder for someone to come away with the, the idea that, I'm promising something. Uh, okay. So, um, 
I feel like we've we've talked about most of the stuff I've wanted to talk about. Um, if you've ha if, if if you had a question that I may have missed, uh, now would be a good time to go ahead and ask it. Um, otherwise, I think I'm going to plan on uh, ending here pretty quick. Um, yeah, so Trill Keys. Um, I do think there is value in an E to F sharp Trill Key. Um, I don't necessarily think it would be a standard key, like like same on contrabassoon. It's not a standard key, um, but I do want once again. So for the prototype, I'm keeping the key work simple, but I do want to be able to test all of the tone holes, um, and if there's a possibility of someone wanting an E to F sharp trill key in the future, or if I want one, I do want to have actually tested that, so I'm not just kind of guessing and sticking it, or putting the tone hole somewhere and hoping for the best. So that's the main reason why I'm I'm adding it to the prototype. Same thing with the third harmonic vent key. Uh, it's not that it's absolutely critical for the uh, uh, prototype, but I do want to test the tone holes and the harmonic vents. Uh, reads. Let me, hold on a second. Let me go grab something. We're... Somewhere around here I have a prototype subcontrabassoon read. Uh, the question is, can I find it easily? So if we have bassoon, contrabassoon, and this is a model of a subcontrabassoon read. So bigger, but not too crazy. For comparison, this is a, a contrabass russophone read right here. Um, so it's about the same length, but a good deal narrower. Um, but once again, that's going to require a lot of experimentation. Uh, the reads are concerned. Uh, so this is what I'm going to start out with. This size. Here. Sorry, I've moved since the last time I used a subcontra read or worked on a subcontra read. So it's it's somewhere over there. Okay. Uh, where would this sit in the band or orchestra? Would it play the tuba line? Um, so band wise, I mean, these are not going to be like bass clarinets. They're not even going to be like, uh, contrabass clarinets or bass saxes. Uh, this is going to be a very new thing. And if it is, does establish a place in the wind ensemble, it's going to take a long time and it's going to come from people writing specific parts for it. Um, I don't see any, even the most crazy Texas high schools, I don't see them buying a sub bassoon just to play the tuba part, uh, uh, with them. Uh, orchestra, it, I mean, it's a member of the bassoon family. So, uh, the, the orchestra tends to sit, um, uh, there, there's not a, generally the woodwind section sits together. So the, a sub contrabassoon would probably sit directly next to the contrabassoon and irritating the heck out of a horn player behind them. Um, and as far as how common would they be, um, I'll put it this way. I would consider it a, a ridiculous, ridiculous success if 30 years from now sub contrabassoons were as common as contrabass flutes are now um that's that's kind of a non-crazy level of success um you know it this is not a this is not an instrument that 
you know, it's going to take the world by storm and everyone's going to want to play it. And, you know, the, the high, the, the junior high bands have to turn people down because, you know, they only have 20 sub contra bassoons and they just can't let little, you know, uh, Judy play sub contra bassoon, uh, because yeah, that, that's not the level of success we're talking about. Um, where it might kind of make uh, a name for itself is kind of like smaller settings, uh, bassoon ensembles, um, places where you could actually appreciate the, the kind of unique timbre more, whereas it would be easy to lose in a... Um, it would have to be well composed for in a large ensemble for you to really... Mm, I, I, I want to say for you to really hear it, but I'm not saying that it wouldn't contribute in a large orchestra. I'm saying that it's kind of like a contrabassoon in a large orchestra. You usually don't come away from an orchestra concert saying, oh yeah, did you listen to that contrabassoon in those 2D sections? That was, yeah, that was great. You, I like to think that you have more positive experiences of the orchestra as a whole because the contrabassoon was there, but unless it's, you know, Composed specifically to hear the contrabassoon, you're not really going to hear it that well. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Theo, I I I I know how you how you feel. One of my uh, the Symphony of Northwest Arkansas just switched to a um, a new seating plan. I'm used to having the principal horn behind me. Uh, but they changed it, so now the principal trumpet behind me is behind me, and the second trumpet is right here. So, first trumpet, second trumpet. Uh, so, about a week after they made that change, I went and got some of those. Uh, I got fitted for those um, uh, some some West Tone custom molded uh, earplugs because, yeah, I <laughs> you you can't sit right in front of trumpets for an entire career. Uh, and not expect some hearing loss, so, or unprotected, I should say. Okay, uh, what would subcontrast in case look like? It's gonna be big. Um, the, um, now one thing, it may not be clear from the design, is, uh, hold on a second, where... So if we look at this top frame, oh, this is the PLA print, so it's okay. We see that it overhangs this uh, on this side a little bit. And that's because uh, I'm designing this top bend to be easily removable. Uh, the idea being that, well, two, two, approaches. One is that you could have two large cases, but large cases that actually fit through doors, um, instead of one absolutely gigantic case. Um, if you make this top piece and the bell section easily removable. Uh, the other advantage is kind of through coincidence. Hold on a second. Let me pull that up. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm pulling up something to talk a little more about the bells, uh, the, the disassembly of the bells to fit in, uh, uh, to hopefully make it a little bit more, um, practical for cases. Um, new bassoon quintets, is it possible to play as a solo instrument? I mean, anything's possible to play as a solo instrument. I can play the giga racket as a solo instrument. That doesn't necessarily mean that's what it's best suited for. Um, although I do think, however, um, I think, um, kind of when people imagine a subcontra bassoon solo, what they're usually thinking of is kind of these lowest possible notes, right? And honestly, those notes are probably not going to be uh, solo material. 
Um, but what it could do is be able to play... So if you're a contrabassoonist, or if you've ever played contrabassoon, you know that kind of the lowest register on any, well, any woodwind is a little bit inflexible, both technique-wise and uh, timbre-wise, or not timbre-wise, but uh, response. So it's possible that if a sub contrabassoon were well made, it could play some of these uh, low contrabassoon parts with a little more um, uh, flexibility. Uh, so uh, dynamic flexibility, uh, pitch flexibility, uh, and just, you know, it's kind of the, the same reason why if, if you had a bassoon solo that was entirely in like the, the low B flat and C and D flat area, it was just all this thumb stuff with, you know, like triple piano or something. I know I would much rather play that on contrabassoon. Uh, likewise, there might be some solos, there are some passages that are technically playable on contrabassoon, but might work better as a sub contrabassoon solo. Once again, because it's not in the extreme bottom range of the instrument. Okay, so, so um, if we take this. So I was saying before about uh, removing the having the, the, the bell section be remedi uh, easily removable. Sorry, got to try to... There we go. And as it happens, if you remove that, it's almost exactly a low C. So right now, it's not, my goal isn't so much to, I don't want to make an instrument in both a C and an A version and then have composer, composers have to try to figure out which, if I'm writing for a sub contrabassoon, can I use C or A? Um, but I do think it's a kind of a, a nice coincidence that if you remove this bell section, it just happens to, to play it, a C. Which means that if you were to, let's say I had a sub contrabassoon gig and I get my part and realize it doesn't go any lower than C, I could decide whether or not it's worthwhile to, to bring that whole extra piece or not. Now, anytime you add or remove large segments of the instrument, you're going to affect the sound. So it's possible that, that removing that will have detrimental uh, impacts to other notes, uh, other registers of the instrument. But um, once again, the, the, main, the main reason I'm doing making that easily removable is for uh, case purposes to uh, so you know it can actually fit in doors um, or fit in cars I should say okay uh, extreme high register I don't know uh, I, I, I I would consider it successful if it plays up to tenor F so F above uh, um, F above bass clef. Um, I would like it to be able to play up to C, and I suspect that it can. What it will sound like, um, if it can't play up that high, or if it uh, doesn't sound good up there, I won't consider it a, uh, a detriment of the instrument, because that range is well covered by both the bassoon and the contrabassoon. Um, okay. Well, I feel like I've covered... Um, uh, most of the questions, uh, yeah, you would have to re, to reset the, um, uh, sorry, uh, I don't think you'd have to reset all these, uh, Bowden connections every time you remove the bell. Uh, I, there, there's a way to, um, assemble it so that that's not, uh, necessary. 
or I, 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 I feel like there is anyway. Um, yeah, you might have to. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there's a way to do it. Um, uh, is the bell similar to uh, the low A baritone saxophones? Um, oh, uh, yeah, in, in size, yes. Um, and in fact, originally my plan was to try to buy a, uh, uh, a Barry Sax bell and modify it for use. Um, but I found out, uh, as I took dimensions of various, uh, berry saxes, I just wasn't going to be able to get one quite the right size. Um, if, if, if I was only going down to low C, it would, it would work perfectly. But for, for low A, it, it, I'm going to need to make something myself. Okay. Well, um, I, I think that that's about it. Once again, uh, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, there was one question I missed, and that is, am I going to uh, try? Am I going to do a better job of keeping all of you updated on YouTube uh, about the project moving forward into 2020? And the answer is yes. Uh, that absolutely, that's something I want to do. And what I'd like to do, if this feels comfortable is uh maybe try to do more streaming maybe not these two hour long streams uh, like this one ended up being uh but um uh kind of short update streams rather than it i i'm not a video editor uh and i usually am kind of working by myself so Doing, you know, these kind of pre-prepared videos for kind of short updates is, uh, takes a lot of time away from the project itself. So if I can do streams, and if this ends up working out well, uh, that might be a, uh, a good way to split the difference, to keep you all more informed in 2020 without uh, having to sacrifice the time that I have in the shop to do, um, uh, to work on the instrument itself. Oh, uh, uh, Joner Games, if you uh, check back towards the uh, beginning of this video, 